Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Today, we have all kinds of stories, including a dog story in which one of our listeners played a key role. You've just got to love the stories, so stick around. Later, we'll talk with Dirk Reuter about the program he's rolled out that collects data on each landing so that pilots can get better at flying stabilized approaches to reduce prop strikes for one high-performance aircraft type. And as you listen to Dirk, I hope you'll think about ways that you can apply some of his techniques to your flying. Last week in episode 194, we talked about my friend Launchpad Marzari, who died in a July 4th plane crash. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And if you haven't done so already, please click on either the subscribe or the follow button in whatever app that you're listening to me now. And if you find any value from this show, please consider supporting it financially. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up to support us via Patreon using your credit card, or you can go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal if you want to make a one-time contribution. Thanks so much. This week in the news, a pilot tries to steal a jet at Denver Centennial Airport. And there's a new bolt-on autopilot for older Cessna 172s. And a man has been fined a quarter of a million dollars for falsifying his pilot credentials. All this and more, and the news starts now. From avweb.com, AirVenture Pilot Proficiency Center to offer remote sessions. The EAA Pilot Proficiency Center will be offering remote simulation exercises and scenarios for people who are unable to attend AirVenture 2021. As with on-site instruction, remote training will be provided by CFIs who are members of either the National Association of Flight Instructors, that's NAFI, or the Society of Aviation and Flight Educators, SAFE. According to Radek Wykowski, EEA Manager of Flight Proficiency, quote, we will be providing the same quality simulation, mission exercises, and scenarios featured at Oshkosh, but in your home or at the Select Flight Training Center near you. We'll connect you with experienced instructors who have trained with proven simulator missions and state-of-the-art remote training tools. AirVenture 2021, of course, takes place July 26th through August 1st in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Pilots interested in participating in the Pilot Proficiency Center remote simulator sessions will need to have access to a home-based Redbird ATD simulator and Zoom, or go to one of 14 participating flight training centers across the U.S. And we'll include links in the show notes on how you can sign up. From 9news.com, that's a TV station in Denver, man tries to steal jet to go to Hawaii, according to the sheriff's office. The man was arrested last week for attempting to steal a jet at Centennial Airport, claiming he was trying to fly to Hawaii. About 1.15 p.m. on Wednesday, Sterling Love, age 30, jumped the south fence at Centennial Airport and walked onto the taxiway near runway 35 right and a Gulfstream G6. The jet was stopped and Love walked up on the steps of the plane to attempt to board. The crew did not let him on. They notified the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office, which determined the situation was in DCSO's jurisdiction. Love was turned over to DCSO, that's the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, and deputies arrested him. Love was booked on suspicion of first-degree aggravated motor vehicle theft. DCSO said it was not filing charges until July 20th, and that Love is in jail in lieu of a $10,000 bail. DCSO said it was unclear whether he was trying to catch a free ride or fly the aircraft himself. From planeandpilotmagazine.com, a bolt-on yoke-mounted autopilot for your Skyhawk. Portapilot has announced the availability of its user bolt-on autopilot, and bolt right off again, that's compatible with many Cessna 172s. The early adopter price for the rig is around $2,000. The unit is available in both one axis, which would be roll, and two axis, roll and pitch versions, and it can be hooked up to your GPS, panel mount, or portable as well. So for a few thousand dollars, you can put an autopilot in your plane and pull it out again and use it in a different plane. The video makes it look quick and easy. What's the legality of it? With most things like this, the FAA takes a hands-off approach, such as attaching portable devices to the panel or other tubes or structures. But is this going too far? Attaching a device to the very control column of your plane? And regardless of the legality, how safe is such a device? Because it requires no STC, the FAA won't be weighing in on this one, so you'll have to take the manufacturer's word for it. Either that or figure it out on your own. Anyway, sounds like a fascinating concept, one I would never have thought of. Uh, there is a video, we'll include a link to it, it shows the uh, autopilot being bolted onto the column that connects the yoke to the, uh, to the aircraft. 
And also from planeandpilotmag.com, FAA says volunteer instructors are being compensated. Now, this is a follow-up on the interview we did with AOPA lawyers in episode 189 when we talked about the Warbirds adventure case. And the story says, facing outrage industry-wide, the agency makes a startling claim that the act of volunteering is, by definition, commercial work. Well, that's kind of hard to believe, but apparently that's what they've determined. Need to get a biennial flight review in your RV7 from your buddy who's a CFI? Good luck. Even if your friend were to provide the instruction for free, they couldn't do it without first getting a letter of deviation authority or LODA from the FAA, without which the flight, paid or unpaid, would be in violation of the FARs. At least that's the FAA's current take on flight training in certain categories of aircraft. Facing the ire of member organizations industry-wide, the FAA is defending its about-face on its interpretation of flight instruction in limited, primary, and experimental category aircraft. They've declared that instructors who volunteer to offer instruction in these aircraft are, by definition, earning compensation. Knowing that the opinion flips the meaning of volunteer on its head, the agency says that volunteer instructors are being compensated by expected work or payment in other forms or, and this is the kicker, by the goodwill they will build with the people they're instructing for free. News of the FAA's semantic contortion was shared by AOPA, which had vehemently protested the agency's flip-flop on the nature of CFI's roles in providing training in these aircraft. This followed a ruling earlier this year by a federal judge that instructors were offering commercial services in the airplane, in essence acting as the operator of an aircraft that the FAA has for many decades viewed as being operated by the owner or controlling entity of the aircraft. Further adding to the overreach is the FAA's claim that compensation occurs even when a third party benefits. In an article detailing the continued revelation of the FAA's about face on training, AOPA's general counsel Justine Harrison wrote, Last week, FAA prosecutors quoted an advisory circular, AC 61 142, defining compensation as the receipt of anything of value that is contingent on the pilot operating the aircraft. It does not require a profit profit motive or actual payment of funds, accumulation of flight time and goodwill in the form of expected future economic benefits can be considered compensation. Furthermore, the pilot does not have to be the party receiving the compensation. Compensation occurs even if a third party receives a benefit as a result of the flight. AOPA President Mark Baker gave some context to the situation saying, quote, the FAA can't have it both ways while claiming it is clarifying the situation. This is contrary to the FAA's mission an obligation to promote safe flight. And the article concludes, we'll keep you apprised, but in the meantime, be aware that AOPA is warning its members that the FAA is actively prosecuting instructors who seem to be circumventing the requirement for them to get a LODA by offering instruction for free. Unless the rule is overturned or the FAA changes its tune, offering training without a LODA, even if it's free, is a legally risky tactic. From avweb.com, lack of paperwork behind most COVID medical denials. The FAA's Federal Air Surgeon says pilots who have had COVID-19 have to come clean with their AMEs or risk losing their medicals. Dr. Susan Northrup wrote in a safety bulletin, AMEs have told us to use their own judgment in determining the fitness to fly for those who have recovered from the disease, but that means pilots have to be ready to furnish the medical records that will support that decision. Quote, unfortunately, while the vast majority of airmen can be issued a certificate by their AME right away, we have denied a medical certificate for a small number of airmen after a COVID infection, Northrop wrote. She said most of those were the result of pilots refusing to provide the documentation. Those who became infected and got through the illness without complications will most likely get their medicals approved routinely. But AMEs have been told to be on the lookout for those who develop issues weeks or months after their COVID-19 diagnosis because the symptoms can be disqualifying. Quote, manifestations include dysfunction of the cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, or neurological systems, Northrop wrote. You should report mental health symptoms such as brain fog, depression, anxiety, or other symptoms such as fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, headache, fever, loss of smell or taste, dizziness when standing, joint or muscle pains, or chest pain to your AME. From avweb.com, Richard Branson reaches 282,000 feet in the first full passenger Virgin Galactic flight. Well, I'm not going to go into this in detail because you've undoubtedly heard about this, but I have a related story. Uh, but if you haven't heard about it, there will undoubtedly be some debate over whether Branson actually reached space. 
Spacecraft reached an apogee of 53.7 miles, technically more than eight miles short of the so-called Kármán line of 62 miles that is the internationally recognized point where space begins. However, the U.S. defines the edge of space as 50 miles or 262,000 feet. And in a related story, also from avweb.com, the FAA launches a system to cut space launch airspace disruptions. The FAA has activated a new tool to minimize disruption of atmospheric flying machines, I guess that means airplanes, when those headed for space are passing through. The Space Data Integrator tracks all spacecraft going up and coming down and transmits the location of those vehicles directly to the air traffic control system. Quote, this new capability increases safety for all airspace users and assists the FAA in efficiently managing air traffic during space operations, the FAA said in a statement. This vastly improves the FAA's situational awareness of where the vehicle is as it travels to space or as it returns to the Earth. The system was first used to manage the airspace when SpaceX's Transporter 2 rocket launched from Cape Canaveral on June 30th. The rocket was actually supposed to launch the day before, but an errant pilot flew an aircraft into the vast exclusion zone established for the launch, which a frustrated Elon Musk called unreasonably gigantic, and the launch was scrubbed. It's not clear if the new system would have prevented the scrub, but FAA Administrator Steve Dixon said the idea is to make the space industry integrate with the rest of aviation with less disruption to both. Quote, this is a critical tool as the number of users of our already busy airspace increases, said Dixon. With this capability, we will be able to safely reopen the airspace more quickly and reduce the number of aircraft and other airspace users affected by a launch or re-entry. From NBCNews.com, Alaskan teen passenger causes plane to nosedive after taking over controls. A passenger on a small plane bound for a tiny western Alaska community said he tried to end his life when he took controls of the plane's yoke and caused it to nosedive before the pilot was able to regain control and safely land the aircraft, Alaska State Troopers said. The incident occurred on a flight between Bethel and Antioch, which is about 90 miles northeast of Bethel. Tripper said a preliminary investigation indicated that an 18-year-old passenger got up from his seat and took control of the yoke before the pilot was able to regain control of the plane with help from passengers. The man told Tripper Jason Bohack he tried to end his life while on the plane and indicated he had spoken with behavioral health officials before but felt it hadn't helped, according to an affidavit by Bohack that accompanied assault and attempted assault charges. The Cessna caravan had six people on board, with all five passenger seats occupied, said Austin McDaniels, a trooper spokesperson. The plane landed safely in Antioch, and the 18-year-old was arrested, troopers said. McDaniels said by email that the man had, quote, asked the pilot to fly the plane earlier during the flight and initially asked to sit in the unoccupied co-pilot seat. Both requests were denied by the pilot. McDaniels said the aircraft had no barriers between the rest of the aircraft and the pilot and co-pilot seats. Barriers are not typical in this type of aircraft in Alaska, or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, the plane was in the process of landing when the incident occurred, about five miles from the airport, McDaniel said. A spokesperson for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alaska said any federal charges would be determined by the outcome of the investigation. The FAA in a statement said it was aware of the incident and investigating. According to the affidavit, the pilot, who was identified as Joshua Kirsch, said about 10 miles from the destination, the man asked if he could fly the plane, and Kirsch refused. About five miles later, Kirsch said he felt the yoke go forward and saw the man over the co-pilot seat pushing on the yoke. He said he thought the man was trying to point the plane toward the ground. Kirsch said he was scared and concerned for the others on board, but said his biggest concern was trying to maintain control of the plane. Several passengers who spoke to Bohawk said they feared for their lives. One passenger, identified as Alice Samuelson, told Bohawk the man seemed to have anxiety before boarding the plane. During the incident, she said a woman grabbed the man after the pilot pushed him away from the controls and that passengers held him down. Another passenger described the man as being held in his seat while the pilot landed the plane. Lee Ryan, president of Ryan Air, the company that operated the flight, said the passenger, quote, was in the second row of seats and just kind of reached over the co-pilot seat and briefly grabbed control of the aircraft. The pilot moved the passenger back and retook control of the plane. Ryan said other passengers, I'd say, restrained the unruly passenger, but he wasn't necessarily trying to do anything at that point. Ryan said the pilot handled the matter very professionally. Quote, we have different types of training and security training and different procedures, and he said he just moved him back in and landed without further incident, got on the radio, and let our company know what was going on. 
He said safety is the air carrier's highest priority, and he was glad this ended without further incident. From GeneralAviationNews.com, this comes from an NTSB final report. Pilot injured after plane hits a tree while runway lights turn off. The pilot reported that while on base like for his third nighttime landing at the airport in Lompoc, California, the runway lights turned off. Despite his failed attempts to turn on the runway lights, he completed his base turn to final turn about 200 feet AGL. By the way, that's pretty low for uh, most aircraft for the turn to final. With the runway lights not illuminated, he decided to use the blue taxiway lights parallel of the runway as his reference to land. While on final approach, the glass star hit a tree, then hit the ground inverted. The airplane sustained substantial damage to the fuselage in the left wing. The pilot sustained minor injuries. The pilot reported that there were no mechanical malfunctions or failures to the engine or airframe that would have precluded normal operation. The pilot did not submit the NTSB Pilot Operator Aircraft Accident Incident Report Form 6120. Probable cause? The pilot's failure to maintain a proper glide path during a night landing, which resulted in impact with a tree. And I'm guessing they have pilot-controlled lighting there. Of course, uh, typically you push the mic button uh, five times and that will turn on the light. But I have seen times where that doesn't work reliably every time. So certainly anytime you're flying into an airport at night that has pilot-controlled lighting, when you're on down, when you may want to push the button five times again just to reset the timer so that there's no chance of the lights going out when you're on short final. Also from GeneralAviationNews.com, another NTSB report, pilot stalls while practicing candy drop. The pilot performed a practice candy drop over a field near Montville, Maine, about 300 feet above the ground. During the climbing 30-degree banked right turn to circle back to the field, he, quote, neglected the airspeed and the Cessna 172 aerodynamically stalled. As it descended, it struck trees and then hit the ground inverted. The plane sustained substantial damage to the left wing and empennage. The pilot reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the airplane that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, the pilot's failure to maintain the proper airspeed and his exceedance of the airplane's critical angle of attack during a low-altitude climbing turn, which resulted in an aerodynamic stall. And from avweb.com, air cocaine pilots acquitted on appeal in French court case. A French court in Aix-en-Provence, which is down near the Mediterranean in southern France, acquitted two pilots of a Dassault Falcon 50 on appeal last week. The pilots, identified as Pascal Faure and Bruno Otis, faced drug smuggling charges and ultimately six years of prison in France after their March 2013 arrest in the Dominican Republic. Authorities there searched the Falcon trijet just before a planned takeoff for France and found 1,500 pounds of cocaine. The drugs were concealed in approximately 20 suitcases belonging to the jet's passenger, who was also arrested and faced charges. After the pilot's arrest on the ramp, a Dominican tribunal in August 2015 handed down a 20-year prison sentence for their, quote, connection to commit international drug smuggling. The pilots fled the Dominican Republic to the French territory of St. Martin, after which the French court of Aix-en-Provence launched its own case into what was popularly dubbed air cocaine. In April 29, the French court also found the pilots guilty. Following lengthy appeals, the French court last week confirmed the sentences for other defendants in the case, but acquitted the pilots Foray and Odos. According to a report in the French newspaper Le Monde, a convicted intermediary in the drug deal told the judge that the pilots were innocent victims of deceit. All of which is to say that as pilots, you need to really be careful about what goes on to the airplane you're flying. And finally, from flyer.co.uk, a story from England, pilot fined 175 pounds, which by the way is around $250,000, for falsifying a license. A Sussex pilot has been fined 175,000 pounds for falsifying license entries and acting as a pilot without an appropriate license. David Harbottle of Lansing, West Sussex, was convicted of two charges of knowingly making false entries to his pilot license and one charge of acting as a pilot without an appropriate license on seven flights following a trial at Brighton Magistrates Court. Mr. Harbottle was fined £50,000 for each of the false entries and a further £75,000 for acting as a pilot without an appropriate license. He was also ordered to pay costs to the CAA of £16,000 and to pay a £120 victim charge. The fines and charges totaled over £191,000. A spokesperson for the CAA said the CAA's prosecution, the subsequent convictions, and substantial fines show that the CAA and the courts treat offending of this kind with the utmost severity. 
Mr. Harbottle previously had certificates of revalidation for his multi-engine piston and instrument rating for his pilot license, which expired in 2014. He later forged certificates of revalidation for an MEP and IR rating he required for the seven flights he undertook and then backdated them to 2016. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, my updates, including some listener stories, and then we'll talk with Dirk Reuter, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now for some updates. Now, each week I search through easily four to 500 stories online, looking for the nine or 10 that make it here into Aviation News Talk. And this week I happened to run across one about one of our Patreon supporters, Jeremy Wade. It's just a very moving story and I wanted to share it with you. This comes from ArkansasOnline.com, which shows you how far and wide I go to search for stories. And it's long, so I'm not going to read the entire thing, but of course I'll have a link in the show notes. It starts out on April 9th, 2011, so 10 years ago, a miniature schnauzer named Razzo wandered into the Arkansas wilderness for an adventure only known to him until this past spring, 10 years later, when he was picked up by an animal control officer in a California trailer park. The next days were a whirlwind journey worthy of a traveler such as the 16-year-old Razzle. Razzle was six months old and the last of the litter when Aaron Howard and his wife Rhonda and two-and-a-half-year-old son Simon took him to their McRae home. Razzle and the family were inseparable. He traveled on vacations. He visited with extended family members. He was such a part of the extended family that when Howard's sister-in-law took her two dogs to get microchipped, she took Razzle too. On that April 9th day in 2011, Razzle was let out on the family's rural property, as he often was, but this time he didn't return. We've looked for him for months, Howard said. We posted posters. Rhonda went on Facebook on April 18th, 2011, and posted a picture asking for help in finding the dog. The social media site was in its early years and lacked strong neighborhood or city groups. The family thought maybe the microchip would return him to them. As the years ticked by, we gave up hope, Howard said. We thought he'd died alone. The voicemail was left in Howard's sister-in-law's phone by the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office. A deputy had seen Razzle wandering and called animal control. Razzle was checked for a chip and the call went out, Howard said. They asked if she could come get him, Howard said. She was like, I'd like to, but he was lost 10 years ago in Arkansas. The Sheriff's Office posted on Facebook about Razzle the following day. Stories like this don't happen every day, but they sure pull at our heartstrings, the post says. We wish Razzle the very best. The end of the story still wasn't known for Razzle. As an aging dog who was living as a stray, it was unknown if Razzle would survive. Debbie Newton, owner of RSQ 209 Animal Rescue in California, saw the sheriff's office post and knew that she had to help. A dog that age should not be sitting in a shelter, Newton said. He crashed a couple of times at the shelter, he was dehydrated, and he wasn't eating well. Through connections with a transport group already organizing the trip to Arkansas, Newton was able to get approval to foster Razzle. Then Jeremy Wade, a California resident and native to Heber Springs, Arkansas, was contacted. Wade has worked with rescue groups to transport dogs up and down the California coast for years. Someone remembered his Arkansas connection. Wade already had a trip to visit family and friends scheduled for July 4th weekend. He was willing to help, but nervous about transporting the aging dog. Quote, since my plane isn't pressurized and the Sierras are in the way, I fashioned an oxygen mask to use for him if needed, Wade said. Typically, when I cross over the Sierras, I breathe supplemental oxygen for the time spent above 12,500 feet. Wade typically flies through the Sierras at 17,000 feet, but found an alternative route at 11,500 feet just for Razzle. He said flying so low through the mountain range was a first for him. The trip from California to Santa Fe was about five and a half hours. There was a stop for fuel and then the next five and a half hours to get Razzle home to Arkansas. Landing the 2007 Cessna Turbo 182T on Tuesday at the airport in Heber Springs, where Wade first sat in a plane as a child, was a mixture of emotions, he said. It took a moment to wake Razzle up. The blind dog, prone to confusion, needed to be awakened gently, Wade said. Then Wade turned to the Howard family and the dog they'd never forgotten. No one knew if the dog would remember his first family or if he had the capability to think clearly at this point in life. The dog doesn't tend to like to be held, Wade said. He certainly isn't comfortable being touched because of the time he spent in a stray situation. He was so peaceful and serene, I had never seen him comfortable in anyone's arms. He got totally relaxed as if he recognized some of the smells. When the Howards returned home to the same home Razzle disappeared from, there wasn't the searching that Newton experienced. 
The family led him out into the yard directly out of the car, Howard said. He doesn't hear or see very well, Howard said. We were like, does he know where he is? The blind dog paced briefly. Then by smell alone, he turned around, walked up the stairs into the front door where he waited for his family. Rousel spent that night sleeping the arms of Rhonda as he spent the night since. He probably won't live much longer, but I'm glad he was able to make it to his final destination first, Wade said. And as for where Rousel was for the past 10 years, well, only Rousel knows. Great story. I'll include a link to the full story as well as to a video that Jeremy shot. And I must say, I'm fascinated by all the cameras he had, one which had kind of a panoramic view of the inside of the uh, airplane. So I'll have to follow up with him to find out more about how he shot that. So kudos to Jeremy for doing this great deed. And I hope it inspires you to do something with your piloting skills to help others. Now, here's a funny voicemail that I got last month from my friend Robert De Laurentiis, the Zen pilot. You may recall we had him on in episode 119 when he talked about what was then his upcoming polar circumnavigation, which he's now completed, and about his previous around-the-world trip in his plane he calls Citizen of the World, which is a highly modified 1983 Gulfstream Turbine Commander 900. Now, here's that voicemail, which I'm including in the show with Robert's permission. Hey, Robert D. Lorenis, I just had the most interesting experience. I was at uh, Mark Golden Pilot Supply, looked up, of course, saw my buddy's uh, two books on the wall, and I thought to myself, well, the guy wrote the books. <laughs> and uh, then about uh, 30 to 60 seconds later, I could hear something coming from my pocket, and your podcast was on. And uh, I didn't you know, search for it or anything. It just came up. And I know these iPhones are getting pretty slick, and occasionally I'll see an ad when I talk to somebody about a topic like a day later. But, uh, wow, Max has really got that uh, voodoo witchcraft thing down. He's quite the salesman. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. Just want to let you know I was thinking about you. Uh, I'm moving up to the uh, Pacific Northwest on uh, Monday, probably for about four or five months. It's my gateway to... Uh, Alaska, Canada, Idaho, and um, start my float plane training on the 28th. So good things are happening. I hope for you as well and look forward to chatting. All right. Bye-bye. Robert, thanks for that fun message and for letting me share it with everyone here. Now let me tell you a little bit about what I've been up to recently. First, the fun part. In the past month, I've flown nine full days in the Cirrus Vision Jet with two local clients, one who is a low-time Vision Jet pilot and the other who I was helping to prep for his type rating training. And earlier today, I heard from him that he passed his type rating check ride for the Vision Jet. So congratulations, Donald. Also, I'll be flying to Denver on Friday, April 27th to teach at a CPPP, which is the Copa Pilot Proficiency Program. That's a weekend-long training program for Cirrus pilots. The CPPP will be held at the Centennial Airport south of Denver. And since I will be getting in a little earlier, I thought I'd hold a listener meetup for anyone who'd like to come out and chat with me for a while. Typically, I hold these outdoors at a Starbucks. And I'm thinking we'll start around 4.30 p.m. and finish up a little before 6 p.m. when I need to get back to the hotel for the start of the CPPP. So I'll pick a Starbucks soon and let you know which one we'll be at. In the meantime, if you think you might be able to join me, please send me an email at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. And now for the sad part. Most of you know that I lost my good friend Brad Marzari on July 4th. Sadly, just nine days later, A colleague and CFI of mine died in a plane crash in Monterey, California. Mary Ellen Carlin was a flight instructor at the flying club where I do most of my teaching with renter pilots. She was 74. The one time I flew with her was when she gave me my endorsement for high altitude operation in a pressurized plane. That training was done in her Cessna 421C Golden Eagle, which is a twin engine aircraft. And unfortunately it was the accident aircraft. I listened to the ATC tapes at liveatc.com. Mary Ellen had an IFR clearance to on top, which is a typical clearance for airports near the Pacific Ocean that often have a thin overcast of stratus clouds in the morning or sometimes early evening called the marine layer. Often it's only a thousand feet thick or less. This layer was probably a little thicker than that as the tops were reported at 2,000 feet. Her clearance was to fly the Monterey 5 departure and then fly radar vectors to the Salinas VOR, with a climb to 5,000 feet. She was to report when she was on top of the clouds and when she was canceling IFR. Now, the Monterey 5 departure is fairly simple. After taking off from runway 10 right, she was to turn left to a heading of 329. Her flight lasted for just a little over a minute, but after takeoff, instead of turning left, 
she ended up in a fairly tight turn to the right. And while the climb initially looked normal, the last data point showed her descending at nearly 2,000 feet per minute at over 200 miles per hour. The plane crashed into a house, which was fortunately unoccupied. She also had a friend on board and the friend's dog. And of course, with such a rapid descent, there were no survivors. One other odd fact is that one of the engines was not in the house, but ended up in a nearby field. It seems unlikely that it fell off the aircraft, so I'm guessing after hitting the house, it became detached and ended up in the field. There's really nothing at all obvious to me as how this crash might have occurred, though I think it's likely it was either some kind of mechanical failure or instrument failure. I will say that I felt a little numb for a few days. I was just starting to get over the loss of Brad Mazzari the week before, only to have another friend die nine days later. I don't really know what to say other than please fly carefully. Captain A.G. Lampu, a British pilot from the early days of aviation, once famously said, aviation in itself is not inherently dangerous, but to an even greater degree than the sea, it is terribly unforgiving of any carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. And we see evidence of that every week, so please do everything you possibly can to avoid becoming yet another aviation statistic. Flying is certainly a lot of fun. I love it. I know you do too, but it's not worth dying over. So please take your flying very seriously and do it very well every time you fly because the alternative is unthinkable. And related to that thought, coming up next, our conversation with Dirk Reuter in the program he's rolled out that collects data on each landing so that pilots can get better at flying stabilized approaches. Right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let me tell you a little bit about Dirk Reuter. Dirk co-founded London-based Lucid Markets, one of the pioneers of electronic market making in the global cash and futures market. He has a PhD in aerospace engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and he owns a Daher TBM 930. He and a friend set a record for flying that airplane from New York to Paris in just eight hours and 35 minutes. And while we'll be talking with Dirk about TBM aircraft, I would love to see someone replicate his work for Cirrus and other aircraft. By the way, Patreon supporters at the $20 a month and up level have been able to see a video version of this interview since last week, which includes the charts that Dirk refers to. Now, for those of you who are listening here on the podcast, I'm going to go ahead and include images under the chapter markers. So if you're using a podcast player that supports chapter markers, you can probably see those images. Now, here's our conversation with Dirk Reuter. Well, Dirk, welcome to the show. Great to have you here today. Thank you, Max. Thank you for having me. So for people who are unfamiliar with TBMs, and these, of course, are fantastic aircraft, go ahead and describe what they're like. Well, I'm, of course, a big fan. Uh, we, we, we currently operate and own our second TBM. And, you know, A, it's, of course, a very, very fast aircraft cruising at 320 knots, enables one to get to one place to another relatively efficiently. It's a global airplane. It's very easy to fly, for example, from, from the U.S. to Europe and back. But on the other hand... Because it's single engine, single engine certified, it has a very, very uh, low and slow stall speed. So when the aircraft is light, for example, one of the lo lowest stall speeds is, is 53 knots with gear down at full flaps. So that's pretty fantastic if one wants to get into very, very short runways or interesting places on planet Earth. So I believe, except for military material, the TBM is probably one of the aircraft with the largest speed range between max cruise speed and landing speed. And that enables it to do all sorts of interesting things. Yes, I've really been impressed with the performance of the TBM. Now, as you started to dig into it, what kind of issues did you find pilots were having landing these aircraft? Well, one of the issues is uh, is a little bit that on balance, people land or approach, you know, the, the runway faster than probably, probably it would be ideally. And the other theme is, of course, that, you know, once the aircraft gets too slow and it can decelerate pretty quickly with the large prop, that um, you know, speed management on short final is, is important, needs to be managed with some precision. Well, I understand prop strikes have been an issue. What's behind that? Well, prop strikes has been you know, a, a bit of an issue, but it just turns out that by understanding uh, you know, one's own approach speed and fly it with a higher degree of precision, you know, we're going to extend essentially the you know, safe operating limit you know, um, of, of the aircraft. I mean, 
I have been known to fly to any number of run, short runways. Uh, for example, in London, we were based in, the, in a runway called Elstree, which is 10 miles north of Heathrow, and that runway is only 2,000 feet long. So to be able to land there, you know, was just important to, uh, to, to get relatively precise. And the plane just simply behaves, you know, beautifully. But it does require bits of training to be precise on the final approach speed, and then also then requires a bit of training to, for the go-arounds. You know, once one adds full power, there was twice situations where I actually had to go around on a very short runway. You know, it requires the application of a large amount of right rudder, and, um, and, and then, then that's all fine. But it was really through my instructor that I became aware of this. Um, you know, we started to look at flight profiles, and the first insight was, what we thought we were flying during training wasn't necessarily what the data represented. And so that was a key insight. Looking up the data became important because neither one of our memory was actually, you know, precise enough and correct. And that was coupled then with, um, you know, uh, you know my, my, my training instructor, Bill Panarello, being involved in the retraining of people who did have prop strikes to get that topic um, and looking at the data, which was really the very beginning of this program. Well, I'm a huge believer in data, as I'm sure you are. And I think of my professor in graduate school, uh, Edwards Deming, who said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> so tell us about what you're doing to gather data to help pilots to fly the TBM more closely to the ideal profile. Well, it was actually relatively straightforward. It started with um, my wife suggesting that we needed a new aircraft. And, you know, this, this, this new 930, you know, was equipped with a Garmin G3000, which is recording you know, fairly extensive amount of data, you know, in, in, on an SD card. And then one just simply takes the SD card out and initially can just simply plot the data really, you know, with Excel or any number of programs and look at it. And, and that's really how this all got started. And then, uh, you know, step by step, what really happened was Bill was sending me more and more emails with, with spreadsheets, with, with this data from, from, from customers and pilots. And at some point I was talking to... Um, you know, our kids and, and ask them whether we could just automate this. And, and that was really sort of the beginning of the program. But then, you know, the larger distribution and making this program more accessible really created a bit of community and a lot of community feedback on, on how to make this better. So the, the current state of the, uh, of the reports is really the result of a large number of interactions and, and, and you know, people in community making a number of suggestions on how to change it. And so it large, you know, it gradually spread step by step. And then the feedback was just simply once, once we learned how to fly the aircraft, you know, largely more precisely and for the proper speed on short final, which by the way is also pretty sensitive in the TBM, more sensitive in other GA aircraft, just because, you know, we're carrying about 2,000 pounds of fuel and the change in the weight from just the fuel alone makes a big difference to, uh, to, to the VREF speed. But then also coming back to this, you know, we then all learned that having a consistent energy state on short final made just for, you know, simply smoother touchdown and smoother landings, which is, you know, generally appreciated by the significant others, business associates and others. So tell us about some of the parameters that you're measuring. Yeah, that's relatively straightforward. It really follows the POH. And in, in the POH, the criterion for the stabilized approach and start under the VMC conditions to make sure that the gear is down and the flaps are set at 500 feet. Then uh, it's desirable to be on a three degree glide path to manage, you know, again, the energy. Then our next point is to have the, you know, be on the speed gate at 500 feet, which in the case of the TBM is 85 knots with a speed gate from 80 to 95 knots. Then as we sort of enter the, uh, the final approach here, from, from 500 feet down to 50 feet. We keep on monitoring the torque, doesn't go low, below 10%. You know, from a turbine aircraft, it is desirable to run the, the, the torque, you know, higher than flight idle, idle to have a, you know, quick response in case uh, animals cross the runway, other things happen. Uh, we further monitor as, uh, you know, described by the flight information letter and the stabilized approach criterion that the descent rate doesn't exceed 1,000 feet per minute. And then on short final, we like to see the aircraft uh, touch um, slow down to 1.3 VSO. But instead of measuring actually 1.3 VSO, what we're measuring is, is the pitch attitude. 
pitch attitude, you know, is not sensitive to errors in the sensor. When the gear is is down and full flaps are set, basically a pitch between minus two and plus three and a half sets limits between 1.2 and 1.4 times the stall speed. And it also has the advantage that it really then focuses from a piloting perspective as, from us looking outside. We know the side picture. We know where the, where, where the engine should be relative to the horizon. And, and that's a, sort of a very good final energy check. And then last, not least, we're looking for a touchdown pitch to be larger than three degrees, which really just makes certain that the nose wheel is off the runway and we touch down with the mains. And there's some margin left for gusts to prevent a nose wheel touchdown, which is really frequently the initiator of a sequence that, you know, results to pilots induced on pitch oscillations. And then last not least, possibly with a prop strike. And I see you've labeled this stabilized approach criteria, VMC at 500 feet AGL. And you've got, looks like seven different criteria and you color coded it green, yellow, and red. Uh, so tell us what that means. Yeah, this is just a, you know, desirable, as you can see here. This is some recent flights of my own. On the left, the, um, the four columns are individual flights. And for the individual flight, the scoring is obviously just simply between 100% and zero. So it's either green or, or zero there. Then if you then go a little bit further to the right, there you see the average score of the last 25 approaches. So you can see that for my specific case, there were just too many approaches where my pitch was on the short final, not, not ideal. And that's why you see the 88% there and it's then marked as red. And then, you know, further to the right, there's a, there's a column which says fleet approaches. This just kind of shows the current averages for everybody's participating in the program. And, you know, we have been setting so sort of limits to delineate between red, yellow, and green. And here you can see that there's a little bit more work desired to be done um, on getting the aircraft largely slow enough at 50 feet. But last not least, this is all about the energy management to make sure that the touchdown pitch is really larger than three degrees. Well, I can see that you're doing a little bit better than the average for the fleet. A lot of green for your last 25 approaches, just one red item, which is the pitch at 500 feet. And for the fleet as a whole, it looks like um, in a number of different areas, there are a lot of yellow areas. Now, I originally saw your reports when they were sent to me by a listener to the show, Fritz, and he was able to show me how he's improved over time. So tell me about the kind of reports that show an individual's progress over time. Yeah, that's terrific. That's actually one of the one of the key observations. Everybody who's participating kind of gets better over time and also more comfortable. So since we're talking about that, I may as well just show you. Here's my 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 personal graph. And as you can see, the data starts here in January of 2019. And these are just now, this is now showing the scores for the individual flights now over time until more recently. The black line here. Is, is shown as an average. And as you can see, you know, even in my case, is pr you know, practiced this for quite some time now, it continues to gradually go up. There's really just an ongoing exercise of learning here as we are now, for example, spending now the summers here out west um, in, in Park City with Heber being the closest airport. You know, there's more challenging approaches because of the terrain that's been taking, you know, my scores down a little bit, but you can see that the scores gradually have been going up, which really just simply as a result of, hey, I had a flight, you look at the score, I got dinged, why is it, let me try to avoid it. And that sort of, you know, flight by flight feedback loop seems to really work for everybody else. If we look at some of these other markers here, for example, here's a graph that shows, you know, in this case, my approach speed at 500 feet, which is really the first gating point from a POH perspective. And again, the limit is between, for the TBM, between 80 and 95 knots. You can see that historically, actually, my averages were right around at the high speed limit of this. Then over the last year or so, I've been coming down while they are now actually reasonably close to, to 85. The other thing you can actually also see is this. If you look at the dispersion, i.e., you know, over a specific month, you look at the highest circles and the lowest circles for these speeds, not just the average. You can see that now over more recent time, you know, the dispersion and essentially the precision, you know, has, 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 has been improving. And some of that's actually been uh, being credited to my friend, Phil Bozek, who started the idea of turning this into a spot landing exercise uh, last year in Michigan. 
And we have now repeated this. And this, this is an exercise where people just kind of fly stabilized approaches and we just measure how close one touches down with the main wheels to the to approach side of the aiming points. And to be able to do that pretty well, one just has to be even more precise on the speed at short file. And so that's what's happening here. So, so my training has been getting a little bit better. My data has been getting a little better because of the, the practical experience of you know, challenging each other from the stabilized approach. So one, yeah, one can see progress. What I like about the chart is the first one you showed shows a line which continues to move higher and higher as you move to the right on average, which shows great overall progress. And then for one of the individual parameters, you show upper and lower limits. And as you mentioned, initially you were a little fast on average, but you brought it down much closer to the target over time. And this to me looks like classic statistical process control with control limits that help you visualize if the process is under control and help you get better and better over time. And this is the first time I've really seen SPC or SQC applied to a pilot's approach data. And to me, this really holds a lot of promise for the future. Um, How many people are currently participating in the program and what are you looking to do in the future with it? Well, the the exciting thing is that, you know, there's been positive feedback from the community. And, and as a result, Daher has uh, adopted this, um, you know, as part of their Me and My TVM app. Da- Daher offers to TVM owners an, an, an app, which is called the Me and My TVM app. And, and, and this app is essentially, a, you know, following step by step, very similar um, analysis of the uh, of the approach path and provides feedback. So so we're currently in a phase which you know we call Pathfinder, but you know current number of users is about 150 people are using it with high frequency at least at least once a month. Out of which is actually terrific. It's it's um, 50 or so users, so one third is uh, is scoring 80 percent or higher. But the focus again, you know, right now is on on participation. So we have a goal to uh, to increase participation to three hundred, which would be you know thirty percent of the fleet. There's about one thousand TBMs flying. Also, that that Simcom, our key uh, you know provider of simulator based training in the TBM fleet, has adopted this program. So people can come to Simcom, share the data, discuss it. It will then you know uh, be be incorporated in the training program and the training sequences. Uh, one can then fly stabilized approaches in the simulator. And the fidelity of the simulator is, is, is quite good. And one can then also actually take the data from the simulator and show the client within minutes, hey, how did I do? Translate it back to the picture and create you know, this feedback loop um, in, in the training program. This is sort of happening as we're speaking. Good friend John Benedictson um, has actually just created an iPad, an iPhone app that makes it much, much easier to download the data. And, and so, um, you know, but we hope that, um, you know, with, with uh, support across the board, we'll get participation up, you know, you know, maybe by Oshkosh or maybe a little bit later this year to some, something like 300 users. And the spot landing contest, that sounds like a good, friendly, competitive way for pilots to try and improve their skills by competing against each other. Is that something you're going to be doing again in the future? And do people have to physically show up at one location to do that or can they do it by themselves? Uh, that, that uh, well, thank you for the suggestion, Max. So yes, we're planning. The first one was in Michigan. The second one was, uh, you know, in Naples, Florida, during the, at the end of the pandemic. Um, we're planning to organizing one out west, and and as of this second, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's it's a social event. The significant others are there. We're having generally good fun. But the main point from the pilots is is this takeaway of, yeah. Well, if I'm off by, you know, five knots, um, it makes a very, very significant difference to the energy management and, and makes us very hard. If one is right on with the speed, I mean, within like two or three knots, it's actually relatively straightforward. But if not, then uh, then that becomes sort of very practical, you know, and just more, it, you know, it's another way of learning compared to just looking at PowerPoints. So that together with a social, you know, component, We'll do that. But people can actually just train it without, you know, it's very simple. You fly an approach, you on an instrument runway, look at the instrument markings, try to touch down with the main gear right at the, um, 
at the you know approach side of the aiming points, which is the big white bars on on the side of an instrument runway. And this is sort of one way to you know provide a challenge literally every approach if one wants to. But getting the feedback on each and every flight, I think is quite key um, to to improving. Well, I think scoring landings makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, when I'm flying with clients, I'm always scoring each landing individually with comments so we can review them afterwards. Yeah, just one more comment on the spot landing challenge is is it's actually really the second event has really become quite competitive. The, the winner of the event managed to consistently get his aircraft touching down the main gear, you know, within four feet of the of, of the line, which um, you know is really really just a terrific feat. You know, Andy Davidson, who 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 uh, you know was able to accomplish this, is is really really quite good. He comes in on a stabilized, perfectly stabilized approach. I mean, it looks like a 737 coming in, really very little changing. And then, you know, just before the aiming point, he sort of flares it very gently into the point, just releases the back pressure microscopically before the touchdown point when he's, you know, floating over the runway and then puts it down in the, you know, at the right spot. Um, but the amazing thing on the program is that the number of people who have been able to do this is really now, is, is now quite material. And then, of course, if one can do that, the confidence for flying into runways like St. Bart's, for example, just to pick one, you know, just goes up dramatically because every time these approaches literally look the same. And it also then, you know, goes back to, hey, my touchdowns become smoother. You know, significant others and business associates appreciate that the TBM is a relatively stiff, straight gear, and it just makes us all around a little bit better. And the spot landing event, of course, adds a whole lot of fun to that. Well, I think anything we measure, we can improve, and it definitely makes sense to try to improve our landings. And I'm curious, are there ways that you can take the solution you've described here and extend it to pilots who are flying other aircraft types with glass cockpit systems that collect similar data? Yeah, I mean, conceptually, this is, um, this is just a matter, matter of um, basically coding up the, the POH requirements or to the degree that flight information letters or stabilized approach criteria exist for, for the aircraft. This is, uh, you know, just fine. In terms of avionics supports, it is, um, you know, within the TBM line focused on, on Garmin equipment. It supports, you know, the G3000, the G1000s, as, as well as, um, you know, G600, um, GTN 750 combinations. So uh, the data collection is, is, is one theme, but extending it to other, to other aircraft is really just a matter of, of um, expanding the program to uh, code it in. Now, my two senses, as I described earlier, you know, success in my head is when this you know, gets fully adopted by Daher, and I'm essentially in a position to shut down my servers. This is not a money-making exercise or anything. This is really just having you know, another way of having some fun and, and fly safer. Um, but I'm happy to share, you know, analytics details with others who are interested. I know currently this is a bit of a manual process for pilots to participate in. What kind of things are occurring that are going to make it easier to automate the process for pilots who want to collect and share this data? Well, well yeah, just as two steps. One is collecting data and making that easy. And the second one is analyzing it. Um, Daher has actually taken an, you know, an exceptional step, uh, when was this, two years ago or something thereabouts, to install a Pratt & Whitney fast box into every one of the new TBMs, which then automatically just downloads an extensive amount of data to Daher and then enables the, the pilots to get basically instant feedback after each flight fully automatically without really doing anything. It looks like these kind of programs are expanding. Uh, the the Fastbox is terrific and has an extensive amount of data just because the way it collects it and enabling trend monitoring of the engine and other terrific things. But then, you know, even somewhat simpler methods of collecting the data like AirSync, for example, which just puts a Wi-Fi enabled, you know, SD card in, into a Garmin system, for example, then automatically generates collects the data and sends it to a server so pilots get their feedback. So these programs are expanding. I think they will continue to expand. Um, you know, my program originally was using just simply an upload mechanism from a web browser. As I mentioned, John Benedictson created a little app on the iPhone, which enables people just to take the SD card out, stick it into the iPhone, transmit the data, and, you know, no more than a minute later, get the report back. Just those little changes seem to be making a difference in the speed of adoption. 
So, um, so yeah, the food future looks pretty bright. Um, it's also, you know, continues to be certain that this, the data is all well protected. It's voluntary in nature. And, and, and it's just a matter of continuing to, to spread the word mouth by mouth by people who have participated in their, you know, getting better. When one of our new TBM owners came to me at an AVEX safety seminar two years ago and said, Derek, I haven't had a, this bad of a score in like 30 years. It was like in the teens. Um, what am I need to do? And then he, uh, he went through, you know, terrific training. And it was all about nine months later, he was comfortable landing at St. Bart's. So it was all around just a very positive experience. And as others, you know, have those experience, I think the program will just simply, you know, continue to grow and expand. So where do people who fly TBMs find out more information about your reports and how they can participate in the program? Well, the TBM is supported by uh, what is called TBM Care, um, you know, the, the, the DAR support team, uh, which makes that all available. Uh, TBM OPA owners can find the details of the program and how to start it, you know, on, on the TBM OPA website. So those are, those are terrific ways to get started. Anybody else who's interested in contacting me for, you know, other aircraft and airframes, as I said, I'm happy to share um, some, some of the details um, if anybody's interested in, in expanding these kind of activities. Great. I'll include your contact information in the show notes. Dirk, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you, Max. And my thanks to Dirk for all of the great work that he's doing to help the TBM community. His contact information is Dirk, D-I-E-R-K, at Reuter, R-E-U-T-E-R, hyphen family.com. So if you are interested in trying to extend his work for other aircraft types, definitely send him an email. I would love to see his work propagated across all kinds of aircraft because I think it can only help make us safer. Now let's look at some listener feedback. Wow, last week's episode about Launchpad Marzari brought a lot of comments. Let me read a few of those. Robert on LinkedIn said, what a fitting tribute Max Truscott. Some people are born to serve. It sounds like Launchpad was one of those people. And from Grant M, he says, whenever I hear of an aviator, I know passing. I think of a beautiful, sad scene in, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, Studio Ghibli's Porco Rosso movie, where a pilot is on the edge of death following a dogfight and sees his dead companions flying up and away to join the other dead aviators. It's well worth watching and imagining Launchpad as one of those ascending pilots in his much-loved FWP-149. And I'll include a link to this uh, video that Grant shared. Alberto C. on YouTube said, although Launchpad would often sign off saying frequency change approved, many of us that had the pleasure to listen to his reports will likely reply unable and stay on frequency just hoping to hear his voice again. Thank you, Launchpad, for everything you've done for us, aviators, aviation enthusiasts, and plane dreamers. Peace to your loved ones and blue skies to you. From patron supporter Martin Kemp, he says, I only got to know Launchpad in the past few months, having heard his reports for years, and he was indeed such a gentle soul with a passion for aviation and especially inspiring the younger generation. He was so full of ideas and brimming with experience, and it's a great loss to the community. I'm heartbroken to lose a friend, and especially in this way, my heart goes out to his wife and family. Nick X says, the lesson I learned from Brad's impact was that it seemed large because he worked hard at being a good friend. Sometimes I let the rush of little things in life get in the way of being the kind of friend I should be. I may never save anyone from a burning building, but I can certainly act more like Brad in welcoming people and making time for them. Again, thanks for telling his story. Patron supporter Don Dillman, who's helped me out uh, on some issues I've had recently. So thank you, Don. He said, just finished your latest podcast concerning Launchpad's accident. I'm sure it was an emotionally taxing process to produce. However, it was a tremendous tribute, and I wish I would have met him. And here's an email from Lee, who flies out of the Truckee Airport and someone who I've flown with in the past. He says, was just listening to your podcast where you talked about the accident in Truckee. I've flown that pattern a hundred times, and even the week of the accident. I've flown the accident aircraft, 89423, and it's painfully climbing in high-density altitude, greater than 8,500 feet, but the density altitude that day wasn't disastrous. That said, I wouldn't have made right traffic in an SR-20 on a summer day when left overhead 270 is the standard, which we talked about and which I have flown in the past when I've flown that traffic pattern. While EFATO, which would be engine failure at takeoff, is an obvious possibility, 
doesn't explain pulling caps at 300 feet. Why give up the role of pilot for passenger at that altitude in an impending crash? When making right or left crosswind off of runway 20, I have to be very vigilant on the controls. It's very easy for a gust of wind to pick up the upwind wing and roll the plane into an unusual attitude. My guess is that is what happened to them that day. Thanks so much for your comments there, Lee. And here's a Facebook post that I would like to read that was posted by one of our mega supporters, Dylan Caldwell. You've heard me read his name in the past. He is an AME who gives flight physicals out of Naples. He's made a very generous offer, so I wanted to let people know about that since I read about it in the Aviators Lounge, which is a group on Facebook. He wrote, hello all, I'm a private pilot and AME in Naples, Florida. I would like to let everyone know that I'm now offering free flight physicals for student pilots 17 years old and younger who need their initial medical certificate in pursuit of their private pilot's license. As we all know, flying is far too expensive now and is prohibitively so for many. I would rather see kids spend their money on more flight time than on a medical examination. If you have any questions, feel free to DM me. Dylan, thanks so much for making that offer. And, you know, I still remember when I was in college, the physician in my hometown in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, actually gave me a break on the price and <laughs> gave me a physical for, for half price. Uh, which I thought was very generous of him. And speaking of generous people, I'd like to thank everyone who takes the couple of minutes it takes to sign up to support the show. Really appreciate that. Believe it or not, only about 3 or 4% of listeners take the time to do that. So if you've thought about it but haven't quite gotten around to it, take a moment today, head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you can sign up for Patreon. Just use your credit card and Choose the amount of money you'd like to donate each month, and you can see what goodies you'll get at the different uh, dollar amounts. Or if you'd like to make a one-time contribution, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. You don't even need a PayPal account. Again, you can just use your credit card. So speaking of generous people, we have a new mega supporter. I want to thank Marlon Dutra. I'll tell you more about him, though I do know he is a, a Cirrus owner who flies here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Some other new patrons, we have Sean Kusick, he has donated at the $20 level, Ross Wyckoff, $35 a month, Seth Barnes, $20 a month, Eyal Shea, $20 a month, Israel Niv, $35 a month, Milo Tour, $20 a month, Scott Holland edited his pledge up to $8 a month, and we have other contributors including W. Ogden, Frederick Nowakobia, and Brian Bullock. We also had a one-time donation from Fred Canavan of $50. Fred's donated a number of times in the past. Thanks so much, Fred. I appreciate that donation. And let me tell you about our mega supporters. I usually tell you about them every month, and we miss doing that in June. So let me tell you about Brian Deere, who's recently moved to Texas and flies a Turbo 206. Matt Souza, he's a computer engineer out of Chicago. He's a student pilot who's planning to take his check ride next month out of Chicago Executive. And I just recently flew with him when he was visiting here in the Bay Area with friends of his. Nice to meet him in person. Tyson Weiss, co-founder and CEO of ForeFlight, which is a popular EFB app. Dave Brochet, he's recently retired from the Navy and currently working on his instrument rating in a Cherokee 140 at the Navy Flying Club in Jacksonville, Florida. Kent Mazia, he and his wife Misty own a 2007 Cirrus at the Alpine Air Park in Wyoming and have a passion for helping others by flying volunteer missions for Angel Flight. And we should do an interview with uh, the folks at Angel Flight. I used to fly for them in the past. Great organization. Victor Vogel, who I've met, he lives in Central PA and flies a Cirrus. Tim Delaney, he's a wealth manager now in Eagle, Idaho. He flies a Turbo SR-22 out of the Nampa Airport. Stephen Elop, who's on the cover of my G3000 book, flies a T-182. And a Citation CJ3+, Plus. he's the CEO of API Jet. Mike Williams, he's the president of TCB Composites, maker of composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft. He flies a 172. Seth Lake, we had him on the show recently. He's a DPE who gives check rides and specializes in teaching the multi-engine rating. And his Beach Travel Airs, I think he has three now. So if you're interested in getting your multi-engine rating and can make it down to Arkansas, check him out at vsl.aero. Rick Miller instructs in the Cincinnati area, both out of the Lunkin Flight Training Center and he flies with private owners of Piper's, Cessna's, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. Says he'd love to teach full-time, but still has that day job. Justin Winters, he brokers real estate on Lake Kiowee in South Carolina. He flies a 2019 SR-22. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation. They've got a pair of Cessna T240s, and they have a 2021 Piper M350 on order. Johnny McDade, he's a singer, songwriter, musician, and record producer. Jim Goldfuss, he's flying out of the Republic Airport on Long Island in New York. 
He's working on his CFI and double I. He's currently teaching aviation at Pilot Proficiency International as an advanced and instrument ground instructor. If you'd like some in-person or online ground instruction, look him up on Facebook at Ground Point Nine. Vincent Salimi, he's the vice mayor for the city of Pinole, California. He's the owner of Salimi Construction Management in San Francisco and president of the Concord Flying Club, the oldest continually operating club west of the Mississippi. Jim Hopp is a CFI I've flown with many years ago. He teaches at Advantage Aviation at the Palo Alto Airport in California. Joseph Sheehan, he flew in the Navy for eight years. He now has a few hundred hours on his new Vision Jet. Josiah Freeman, who's working on his instrument rating. Dylan Caldwell, who we just talked about, an AME at the Naples Municipal Airport in Florida. You can find out more about him at aviatorsclinic.com. William Birch donates the show in the memory of his son, Lieutenant J.G. Wallace Birch, who was a naval aviator. Don Hakala with Professional Instrument Courses. They conduct 10-day instrument courses, IFR Finish Up, and IFR Refresher courses. You can find more about them at iflyifr.com. Don Dillman, who I mentioned a moment ago, he's a professional pilot who runs an airline flight department. He's also a CFI, flies a Bonanza, and he's one of the newest Cirrus CSIP instructors. So congratulations, Don. Rick Mattis flies a Cessna 210 out of Fort Worth Meacham Airport. John Tosto lives in Flint, Michigan and flies four planes for rent at the Greater Flint Pilots Association. He also co ends Cherokee 6. Vic Bajaj, who lives here in the San Francisco Bay Area and flies a Cirrus. Mark Holzbach, he lives in southwestern PA, my home state. He's a longtime aviation enthusiast who wants to get his private when he retires in a few years. Currently, he runs BodenSteel.com, which makes industrial fasteners. Tim Crawford flies a DA-40 at Crosswinds Aviation at the Oakland County Airport north of Detroit. He runs a company called BrainSpring that helps kids with dyslexia. Greg Van, he's a senior AME at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and he's the host of the Mayo Clinic Clear Approach podcast, which discusses medical issues for pilots. James Kerr, who's interested in buying a Cirrus for business travel. His company makes security screens for protecting your home, and you can find out more at bosssecuritiescreens.com. Aurel English, he's a CFI and double I at the Westchester Flying Club at Westchester County Airport. He and a friend have created a website to make free flight planning modern and fast. The site is called Flyway, and you can check it out at flyway.cc. Ed Kelly flies a Saratoga out of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and says his two-year-old son Bennett is the best co-pilot he could have. Jeff Brausch, who I talked to recently on the phone, I want to thank him for his support. Michael Ron, he runs a small wealth management firm in Woodland, Texas, which you can find at thesumplanning.com. And he's also thinking of buying a Cirrus. Todd Cussell lives in Arizona and flies an SR-22 TG-6. Chris Carnahan, president of Boone Valley Forest Products. He flies a VTAL Bonanza out of Spirit Airport in St. Louis. And Marlon Dutra, who I'll tell you more about next time. And I want to thank all of you who contribute to the show in any way, especially those of you who share the show with your friends. Just click on the share button and tell somebody you love about the Aviation News Talk podcast. That's it. See you next week. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.